Dave. Hello, everyone. My name is Justin Thomas James, and welcome to yet another episode of Sound Booth Theater Live. We are live. Live. Hello. Oh, right. we have me in the background. Welcome now in stereo, Hello. Sound Booth Theater me? Live. No, it's not me. It's not me. I didn't do it. All right. Live. I think. Oh, we have me in the background. Is that now in stereo, Sound Booth That's Theater Live. Oh, Dude, technical difficulties oh, here. Right. Are you? Oh, <laughs> we're 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 in uh, Sound Booth Theater Live section right now. Um, uh, Lars, do you have it? Uh, okay, you might need to mute yours. Are you watching it on YouTube? What's up, Roman? I see Roman in the chat. Yeah, who all is here? So, oh Lars, if you are able to mute your uh, YouTube. There we go. We'll mute, mute the YouTube or maybe... Uh, I just did. I'm just trying to mute the uh, mic as well. Um, might be me. Uh, okay. Just okay. I think it everything for everybody. I think it worked as well. I'm not hearing myself. All yeah, right, I'm, there you go. Uh, that was... Yeah. We need to start shows. We need to start start shows with a list of rules from now on because we keep forgetting. <laughs> yeah, keep, I keep on forgetting that one too. Well, that was a fun little uh, audio experiment that, yeah, we did that uh, planned time. out, and um, I hope you all enjoyed that. Yeah. Once again, my name is Justin Thomas James. This is Sound Booth Theater Live, and I am here with the ever talented Lars M, which is Hello. short for. Mach Mach Müller. Seriously, you got that in one? I mean, I got nobody, that in one. Nobody does that. Is that Mach it? Do they say Mach Müller? Uh, or Mac? I was actually it was written Mac Müller like McDonald's the other day. Oh yeah. They have like several different types of uh, writing. You never yeah. know. Well, you got Mach one, you got Mach two, you got Mach three, and you got Mach Müller. Yeah. So Which, um, just. I totally would have butchered that. Slightly bit slower and uh, just more Germanic. Germanic. <laughs> Mach, Mach Müller. Uh, good. All right. Well, we're here with Lars, and we're also here with the one, the only incomparable Sound Booth Theater creator, Jeff Hayes. There he is. Thanks for the intro, Justin. And thanks My for having me on your show. Oh, thank you. Yes, I've, I've taken over. Yeah. I'm now the owner and proprietor. Of Sound Booth Theater, not actually just just the, just the videos, just, just the videos. I'm keeping all the royalties. And um, welcome, welcome everybody. Who all is here? Who's watching? Uh, if you're here, leave a uh, shout out in the 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 YouTube comments. Um, I know Jeff is watching YouTube the YouTube comments, and I believe Lars is as well. So uh, keep an eye out there, and um, if anybody has any questions, we'll try to answer them. So yeah. What are we here? What what are we here for? What are we doing? Why are we doing this right now? Well, Mr. Lars M has come up with a story called The Wayward Bard. Uh, I believe it started on Royal Road. Is that right? True. Uh, and uh, we're going to be turning it into an audiobook here at Sound Booth Theater. And um, this episode is dedicated to The Wayward Bard. And um, for anybody who doesn't know about it, it is a gamelet. But Lars, why don't you talk a little bit about it? What is this book about? Uh, what can you tell us about it? All right. Well, the short uh, short version is the one that uh, you have Daniel, this regular old nobody who has an eight to five job in the bank. He's just, well, no, nothing special. He games, he uh, plays the violin, and he is bored as hell with his job. And well, one day he comes upon an extraordinary possibility to uh, run away with a lot of money, and he takes it. And then uh, instead of just jumping on the nearest airplane and uh, being chased down by the mobster he stole the money from, he decides to lay low within. A computer game and um, well that's where we start he, he's a violinist so of course he wants to play a part and if you have a ton of cash with you 
and you want to enjoy yourself, well, of course, you put all your points into charisma and then you just sit back and enjoy yourself, spend your money and uh, well, live it up. Live it up. Yeah, so this- that's, of course, where things start going wrong. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Yeah, he kind of messes up there with his... Uh, uh, enthusiasm for the life he wants to live. So he yeah. he goes into he goes to a company, Exogenics, right? Mm-hmm. And they are a um, well, they create video games, and they created a VR um, RPG called World of Chains. Exactly, and uh, we haven't even gone into the part about the chains yet, but I am going to introduce that in the coming books, but uh, it's not the uh, usual, well, of course, any any writer would say that it's not the usual VR game everybody uh, mm-hmm. spends, but this is not the usual 200 million players game. This is a small game which overcharges completely, and then it rewards you by making the game basically difficult as hell. And that's that's the premise. There are no uh, easy keyboard functions. You have to learn everything by yourself. You want to be good at playing with a sword. You have to learn to actually play with a sword. So that's right. what it goes into. And of course, he has the violin skill to to begin with. And what he wants abuse. <laughs> Yes, of course. And we're going to be doing some readings um, from the book. We're going to be jumping pretty far in um, after Daniel's been transported into World of Chains. He pretty much uh, gets introduced to a very small village and he's trying to get to one of the big cities. And you correct me if I'm uh, going off at all, Lars. Uh, He's trying to get to one of the big cities where he can really take advantage of his uh, bard skills and, you know, meet some ladies and have some fun. Uh, but he's stuck in this middle of nowhere village and, um, he kind of ruins his chances at getting to one of the big cities. So he's kind of got to build his reputation in this town. And, uh, what's the town called again, Lars? Grand Crossing. Grand it's- Crossing. Yeah, exactly. It's so so glorious. It's so magnificent, a village that it's actually named after the person who uh, built the place crossing a river. That's that's it. That's the entire story. <laughs> yeah. And um, so he does a lot of quests to try to build up his reputation. And um, he meets a bird. And that's the scene we're going to start start off with. It's actually chapter nine, um, where we're jumping over a whole bunch of stuff. But I wanted to showcase and talk a little bit about um, the bard aspect of uh, of the game and and what he experiences. And he basically meets another bard who's going to train him, and uh, that's what this scene is about. And hopefully you'll get another, a bit more of an idea about the world, uh, just as we narrate through this. Jeff is going to be playing uh, the the wise bard, Grek. Um, okay, first, wait a minute. We got, there's an issue here with the, uh, <clears throat> with the manuscript. I don't know. Oh what no, what's up? It's the... The table of contents doesn't really make any sense. Okay, well, I guess the rest of the oh. book is here, though. So, table of contents um, is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah, well, <laughs> K- K- try, L- try tap it on one. Uh, Whoa! Yeah, what? Exactly. Okay, so you said chapter nine? Chapter nine, yeah. Just uh, do a search for chapter nine, and yeah, you'll yeah. get there. Be... Off to a good start. So what else? So tell us a little bit about the, um, how he discovers, uh, or how he starts getting into playing, uh, in this local town, Lars. Well, um, yeah, the, the way, like you described yourself, he starts off from behind. He, uh, has a bit of an incident where he, uh, basically manages to, uh, 
make himself on bad terms with uh, more or less the entire village. So he has to start off by uh, doing something, and that something, of course, is to go and get stinking drunk. Yes. Yeah, well, that's uh, the that. wise choice. I mean, what, what any bard would do, right? <laughs> um, and then mid-drink, when he uh, discovers that even the bartender isn't really willing to uh, to have fun with him or back and forth with him, he realizes, well, he, he'll have to start somewhere. And then he starts out by trying to bef and befriend, <coughs> sorry, befriend the bartender and work his way from there because of course the bartender knows everybody so if he's besties with the bartender he'll have an in for the rest of the village right and uh well things get a little dull for a while there uh, while he does a lot of uh, make do work yeah yeah helping out around the bar and stuff yeah, right? exactly Un until the uh, the bartender says well all right you might not be as big of an uh, asshole as I initially thought. Why don't you take that violin you found and jump, on, and jump up on that stage and try to impress people here? Right, yes, because he finds the violin in like the back while he's helping clean up, right? Yeah. And uh, well, that's uh, he manages luckily to impress villagers, uh, but. Uh, then discovers that the violin he found, that was actually the one that belonged to the old bard, Greg. Right. The one who, well, not trying to ruin everything, but who has sunk into a sea of alcohol and <laughs> bad tempers. <laughs> yes, a sea well, of alcohol. And I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna a lot we're of going to be... This, in this book. <laughs> At least a couple. Uh, um, so that's that's who we're going to be meeting uh, in this scene uh, in Chapter 9. We're meeting Grek. Uh, and uh, have you got it ready, Jeff? I do. Excellent. All right. Let's do this. The Wayward Bird. Chapter 9, off to a good start. Back in the tavern, I'd spent a short while trying to improve on the looks of my tattered clothing and failing horribly before having a short but pleasant solitary lunch. Now I was wondering whether Grek would even show up or not. He was already a quarter of an hour late. Given his less than stellar reputation, I wouldn't have been entirely surprised if he showed up an hour late or not at all. I decided that I might as well spend my time wisely and asked Jeb if they needed some help around the place received the repeatable quest, no idle hands in this place again, and was asked to clean the candle holders and chandeliers all over the main tavern room. I got to work and just made sure to keep an eye on the door. Moving methodically around the room, I'd finished with the candles along three of the walls and moved to the fourth, when I noticed a pile of dirty rags stashed at one end of the long bench that was placed alongside the wall. Grimacing with disgust at the smell, even in a frigging game, some pricks would be unconscionable enough to even to just leave their dirty garbage in the tavern for others to clean up. I started to pick up the pile. When out of nowhere, it moved. I froze, and suddenly a monster appeared from the middle of the pile with a growl. A small and scaled reptilian head with a long snout appeared, blinking its mouth, gaping wide and showing off several rows of small, sharp teeth. I stumbled backwards, grasping for my short sword, when the creature rose halfway from the bench and spoke. Uh, oh, it's noon already. My brain was apparently unable to function at this point. My ass hit the floor, and I could do nothing but stare incomprehendingly, while the monster continued to ignore me, holding its head in both hands and mumbling. He then yelled, Kid, give me some ale. Jeb, who apparently knew the creature, dumped a tankard on the bench with a sour look and left again. At this point, my brains decided to rejoin the party. They allied themselves with my feet, and once again, I, and once I had succeeded in getting back to my feet, they were jointly able to convince my gaping mouth to work once again. I cleared my throat loudly. <clears> throat> um, 
Greg Durzum, uh, I got this note and, uh, well, I've been looking out for you, but didn't see you until now and, uh, you wanted to meet? Greg stood, evidently th thought better of it, sat down again and drained his tankard in one long go. While he did this, I got a better look at him, and sitting, he was clearly no monster, or at least a humanoid monster. While he definitely seemed a sorry person at the moment and was only about 1.2 meters in height, he was still an impressive sight, looking exactly how I'd imagine a cross between a dragon and a small human. His body was greenish-brown, his snout elongated and his head topped by a backwards-flowing ridge of spiked protrusions running from his forehead and down his back, and seemingly continuing all the way until the end of his long, prehensile tail, which at the moment seemed to help him keep his balance on the bench. His hands and feet were more claws than digits, but would definitely allow for handling tools. His stench was hard to describe, somewhere between cheap drink, vomit, and wet dog, but his facial expression was easily described, a universal, oh my god, what did I drink last night, expression. After downing the ale, he seemed to slowly come to his senses, and he peered up at me and softly grumbled. Uh, you still there? Good. Get me another ale, and we'll talk. I wasn't exactly sure whether his accent was because he was a kobold, still drunk, or because common wasn't his first language. But he was pretty hard to follow. A minute later, I returned from the bar, pushed two tankards in front of Grek, and took a pull of my own ale. His eyes flashed in satisfaction, and he took another long pull of the first tankard before he started speaking. Uh, so, you want to be a bard, right? <clears throat> I frowned and responded, What do you mean? I am a bard. He snorted. Piss off, kid. Bards got spells. Flash. Skills. You got that? Nah. You know how to play the violin. I ain't no bard, though. Ain't gonna repeat myself again. You want to be a bard? You have been offered a quest. Bard class trial. Entering the world of song. Grek Durzum has graciously offered to introduce you to the world of bards. Make it through the test in order to advance as a bard. Reward? Variable. Depends on the success. Accept or decline? <laughs> Accept? Yes, uh, of course, I would love to learn more about being a bard. Uh, what should I do? He grinned, quite an intimidating display with the number of teeth he was showing, and his breath, which was downright horrible. Oh, just follow and try not to disappoint. You need anything before we leave? Nope. Good. I followed Greg's lead and walked silently alongside him as we he left the tavern and crossed the town square to the mayor's house, and watched slack-jawed, as he told his conf as he told the confused gnome, another one for the grinder. Get with the portal already, woman. Got work to do today. To my great surprise, she actually did as he was said without any reaction, except for her mumbling under her breath the whole time. And of course, she stared at me like it was my fault that he was a rude bastard. A minute and a half later, I followed Grek without any incidents through a, through a yellowish, shimmering portal and found myself situated, slightly nauseated but otherwise okay, in the middle of a dimly lit brick tunnel which I could only surmise was somewhere underground. Looking around, I could spot the end of the tunnel behind me. Looked like the tunnel had collapsed quite thoroughly. Grek right next to me and, a fact my nerves found quite soothing, the return portal right there. A pop-up appeared, stating, Important. For the duration of the class quest, your respawn location has been automatically reset to your current location. All experience gained will be awarded upon completion of the quest. Huh. That meant that whatever I was about to bump into might be lethal, and also, they didn't want me to gain a level halfway and find the dungeon too easy. Without any ceremony, Grek dumped two scrolls on the ground next to me. 
ought to make you a mite less useless. <clears throat> now, get. Try not to bore him to sleep, yeah? Confused, I picked up the scrolls and asked, uh, So, I do whatever it is I need to do to complete the trial and return to you here? He grinned, a quite disconcerting view, showing off his feral-looking rack of teeth, and barked a laugh. <laughs> nah, you make it outside, or you don't make it at all. And with this final remark, he stepped through the portal, which shimmered out of existence, along with him. And scene. All right, so how, did, how did it go? How'd it go, Lars? Perfect. That, that is just the expression I was going for. I mean, uh, there is no doubt that uh, Jeff does an impressive bastard when he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it I comes so naturally to you, Jeff. The yeah, it's you know, I have experience. <laughs> no, seriously, it it's um just wonderful and uh, back and forth between you two. It that's exactly what I was going for. At at awesome. first, I was doing like a Cockney, and then yeah, it, yeah. It, and then he's and then the text said, "Oh, he's got this different accent that he can't even really pinpoint." So I just kind of like mixed in a little Scottish with it. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they just turn yeah scottish irish somewhere around yeah. there <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. I maybe that's is that maybe where you want want me to be in that area yeah, yeah not uh, not too clearly irish but uh, some uh, mumbling gargling uh, or yeah just a different tang along that uh, that style that and that would be great yeah cool Perfect. okay the uh, there are it's a very um, diverse uh, village, Grant's Crossing. There's dwarves and gnomes and uh, halflings, orcs, or half-orcs, rather, and kobolds, uh, apparently. Um, do you have, like, with the voices of your characters, are you going for, like, for all the dwarves, like, are you thinking, like, a dwarvish, classic Scottish accent? Or how would you, how are you thinking? No, uh, I would um, actually... Uh rather avoid that one i mean uh, I, I would like to have the usual you know uh, dwarves have naturally gruff voices yeah. or rough voices but if if we can avoid the scottish that would be nice i mean uh like church uh, the church hawk the yes. local historian i i would like for him to be uh, eloquent and still have this uh natural <clears throat> right yeah, yeah. Okay. that's interesting because like like i think traditionally it is you know dwarves have scottish accents you know this is this this and this but without really thinking of sometimes without really thinking of okay what has this dwarf's upbringing been like like if this is someone who's pretty much lived among the common speakers yeah. his whole life he's not going to sound like all the other dwarves that he doesn't really know too well uh, exactly and you have i mean you have tons of races and how many races have accents mm -hmm. i mean it's really not that common and it's just i i blame uh, lord of the rings mostly yeah. <laughs> yeah. but uh, <laughs> but i i mean i i enjoy it but uh, i'd like to do just like like you say it depends on where it comes from uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Jeff? On um, voice application to different dwarf, races, to dwarves in particular, uh, or or to different races? Because like different I don't know. Yeah. Here's the thing: like, there's the truth, and then there's what evokes an image in someone's mind, mm. right? So, like, if if you use a Scottish accent for a dwarf, it's probably going to evoke a dwarf in people's minds better than just a regular. Uh, a, a you know a straight American accent, but you know it, you can always insert character into into any anyone with with just acting and still evoke that. So I mean, mm -hmm. I'd say the Scottish accent is like a crutch, you know, and it's like it's like an easy, it's like a snap to uh, knee jerk reaction. Right. Um, but you know, it if like I think truth 
maybe outweighs that you know like for instance Lars is saying like no this is not how I want my character to be and and so I think uh trusting that and respecting that is a challenge but it's also worth doing because his vision you know like an author's vision is very important to us at least at sound blue theater for mm. making sure that it comes to life properly so um yeah I, I i get that it makes a lot of sense to try and deviate from the stereotype just to yeah. make it a little more rich and a little more interesting right exactly um so i mean we're gonna keep going so the um he goes on this daniel goes on this trial for Greg and basically Greg has dropped him in this place and like, all right, see you when you're done. And, um, uh, we're going to be jumping. We're not going to do the whole chapter for you, but, um, he learns a couple bard skills and I uh, just, would you be able to summarize a little bit about what your vision is for the bard skills that you've created in this book? Cause I, I, I read through it and it's, it's very interesting what you're the sort of system you're coming up with. Yeah, um, well, a uh, couple of worlds have uh, in fantasy books or lit RPG or game lit uh, worlds around, they have done something relatively similar, as in there is this large pool of magic within the world or under the world or wherever it's placed. And we can all dip into that part if we have the skills and the magic uh, uh, what do you call it, affiliation or whatever you need in order to mm -hmm. reach out and touch them. Um, in my world, basically, when you choose a class, you choose exactly how you want to dip into that sea. If, you, if you're a shaman, well, you, of course, need your uh, silly little drums and your dances and your feathers and whatnot. And uh, if you're a wizard, you'll need your chants and your uh, drawing flaming uh, visions in the air while you uh, eloquate your spells and so on. I mean, you decide exactly what you need. Mm -hmm. You have your skill and then you have the way you, um, yeah, the way your class um, introduces themselves or, or touches the magic. Right. And uh, for a bard, well, there's the skill in magic, and then you have the music, of course. The music is the way you use in order to touch the sea of magic and draw forth exactly what you want. So in order to, um, to create a spell, to create a, a spell especially for yourself, well, you decide what do I want to do? And uh, if we take the sleep spell that he learned, for instance, well, uh, he's had, as a kid, one of uh, Brahms, I, I believe. Uh, yeah. Vegan lead. Yeah, vegan lead. Uh, exactly. Played to him as a child for ages and ages in order to make him go to sleep. And, of course, that's the song he uses for the spell when he wants to learn it for the first time. Right. And that's how he pulls it out. And this is not something uh, you can just do on the fly. I mean, uh, this is not a story where you'd be able to just say, oh man, I'm up against the dragon. I need something that ignores uh, fire resistance or whatever. You wouldn't be able to do that because you need to have the skills and you need to do it just right mm. in order to get it the first time. So you able to yeah. Yeah, so being able to do it just right. I mean, we're we're gonna do. A, I'm gonna just narrate a little bit of a sample of that sleep um, spell. I thought that was really cool. So basically, he goes into this this dungeon, and um, I think he dies three times um, before he he actually starts making some headway. He runs into a, a trap first, not to really spoil too much, and then he runs into a um, a kobold, and um, he tries talking to the kobold, kobold kills him. He tries um, fighting the kobold, kobold kills him. Um, but then he comes up with another solution to, to this, and he is reminded of his childhood. And I'm just going to try and find the spot here. Um, there we go.
Are you, are you going to need me for this for this section? No, it's just going to be a oh. short little okay, cool. section. I'll be right back. I got to oh, uh, yeah. fill on coffee and other fluids. There is technically one Grek line, but it's just a memory. So it'll be okay. All right. So, yeah. So he's been struggling through this. And um, this is how he kind of starts learning how to tap into the world for himself. Unfortunately, dying a couple of times more would leave me entirely naked and possibly without my violin as well. And I didn't think much of my chances without the damage boost I received from the instrument. For sure, I had received an increase to my unarmored dodge skill, but it would have to increase just a tiny bit faster to be any help. Also, this was the very first mob. What were the odds that a class quest involved only one single enemy? Something just felt wrong about the entire quest. Sure, exogenics didn't cuddle you, but I'd never heard about a class quest where you were left without any chance of success or any guidance whatsoever. I glanced up at the sign again, cursing exogenics once again. Rest in peace, my ass. More like rest in pieces in my... Wait a minute. What was it that Grek had said before leaving me stranded? Try not to bore them to sleep. Or something like that. Could it really be this simple? Well, it wasn't as if I had much to lose at this point. I slowly stood up, cocked the violin and bow, entered the guard's room, and started playing. It was a simple tune, but one I could play dead, drunk, and blindfolded. A tune that had followed me since my parents had played it for me during my own childhood. The vegan lead, Cradle Song, by Brahms. Involuntarily, even while playing, my body tensed in anticipation of the guard's attack. But miraculously, nothing happened. He just stared straight through me, clearly without seeing anything, and with his entire being focused on my playing, I had started playing lightly, but quickly built up the intensity, insistently lowering the guard's defenses, and inside my mind, the entire time, was I singing the mantra of parents everywhere. Go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep already, you little bastard. When he slowly lowered his body to the ground and closed his eyes, I was so high strung with emotion that I could cry. And when I received the pop-up, congratulations, you have learned the spell, sleep. And that's all I want to go into there. Um, so he learns this ability by tapping into something that was deep inside him. Um, is there anything else you wanted to, to comment on what happened here and how this is going to play out? And of course, uh, there's going to be a further elaboration on how magic actually works and the system makes it easier for people to uh, learn stuff like this on, on their first class quests because otherwise, I mean, the, the player wouldn't have a chance to actually learn anything if they had to make it up all, all by themselves. But uh, right. but yeah, you, you've got a good, and really please uh, <laughs> sing it like that when you do it for the book. Oh, that was <laughs> wonderful. Sure, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, that's actually one thing um, to all of you who are watching the Sound Booth Theater, you're privy to the information that uh, Sound Booth Theater, once again, we've done it once before, but once again, we're going to be adding some music to the actual production. Uh, and what was the book that you guys did that with before, Jeff? Okay, so we had, I mean, I have sort of a, a long relationship with music and audiobooks um, because when I first started uh, back, like way back, well, I think the first book that I real that I put music in was called Balance by M.R. Forbes. And that was like five years ago now. Um, but I, I just I just composed music for the book bookends, right? Like the beginning and, and the end of the book. And like so it wasn't really part of the production. It's just kind of like something to get you in the mood before you start. Um, but uh, now, like now, I, I haven't been doing that because I put a lot of effort into that back then. You know, I, I did like a full orchestral composition, you know, so 
I was like, okay, this is, this is, it's enough. You know, <laughs> like I can't, there's too many clients. I can't keep doing this. Um, but then, you know, as, as time has gone on and I've, I've been wanting to incorporate music actually into the book, like to be more relevant, uh, for the experience, we've been doing it a little bit more. So the first one that's actually going to be released with music in it is Goblin King by R.R. Verdi. Um, and then we are also working on Monster Hunt NYC, uh, which is actually, I mean, the entire book is based around these two musicians and there's songs written in the book and um, it's, there's going to be background music and it's all going to be thematic and, and like that's actually going to be a full on audio drama. Um, so those, but Monster Hunt and NYC, it's taking a while. Um, the tragedy that happened with the music producer, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a really intimidating project. We gotta, we gotta make sure it all fits right, you mm -hmm. know, and that, that's, that's tough. You know, I, I think I'm going to have to, I've already narrated the entire book. Annie and I are finished recording all the voices, but it looks like I might, may have to re-record a lot of the narration just because when you, when you just stick music underneath narration it doesn't it doesn't quite work right i have to right. i have to actually take the music once it's done being produced stick it into the into the file and then narrate to the music so that i'm actually in sync with it so that i'm oh. i'm you know i'm i'm in beat and um you know taking music cues to you, you know so mm -hmm. it weaves in instead of just being pasted on top Right. Yeah. It's, it's a tricky Intensity thing. Too. Um, yeah. As, as, and especially when it's like chill, like Monster Hunt, Monster Hunt NYC, you know, it's, it's not like orchestral, you know, it's like, there's a reason why my, why movie scores have a lot of actually, you know, orchestral base behind them is because it's, it's more flowy. There's, it's not as rhythmic and it's, it's, more emotional whereas the music that we're doing for monster hunt nyc it's about these two people who are in a band and they play poppier stuff and they play jazzier stuff you know so there's like a beat to it um and mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't really lend itself as much to to uh being a score but for this book for the wayward bard um i think what i and correct me if i'm wrong it seems like you're going to be in inserting music uh in certain places and not necessarily narrating over it is that right uh yeah yeah so um it's going to be a little bit of both i think depending on how it lines up with the text because mm -hmm. sometimes there are there are nice sections where like a chapter will close for example with daniel playing a, a piece on the violin and in those situations i'll probably have the 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 music start while he's talking and then um finish the chapter the, the the chapter will close on a musical note quite literally and um but then there are also sections where he's just saying okay so then i go into this piece it's fast it's fiery it's the perfect you know thing to get this emotion across and in those instances i am just going to have it kind of underpinned um while the narration is happening and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, uh, the potential to have to go back and re-record your, your narrating over it because I think that might inform my process a little bit uh, on the music uh, and, and production. I've got a violin. I've got a violinist who nice. is, is fantastic. She's going to be absolutely amazing for this. So um, I'm really excited for that. Uh, I'm curious, Lars, yourself. So this is your first book, right? Yeah, completely. Uh, and you write it about a musician. Are you yourself a musician into music? In the meantime, um, I'm a huge music fan generally, but uh, I wouldn't even put that into uh, to the discussion here because I'm a huge metalhead. So, oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. I mean, 99.9% uh, .9 of all people worldwide wouldn't even call what I listen to music. So uh, let's not take that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, it accepts Scotty Fudge for some reason. I mean, uh, he and I share a bit of taste, so that's a that's a good one. Who, who are your who are your favorite bands right now? Uh, right now, I'd say uh, Timu Borgir, uh, Arturos, uh, 
and anal nachrak. Hmm. Anal nachracht. Yeah. yeah, which is completely crazy. So, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever listened? My, my favorite metal right now is Animals as Leaders. I don't know if you've heard heard them. Yeah, and that, and that's pretty nice. And oh yeah, and um, one I bumped into just five days ago or so, Seal and Ardor, which is awesome. And uh, the weirdest mix, you mix uh, death metal with the growling and stuff with the uh, old fashioned uh, slave music. I mean, like oh. the old soul music, it works. Grave diggers chant, devil is yeah, mine. Exactly. Uh, it's crazy good, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't expect it to be good, but it was awesome. I will check this out. For those of you watching, um, let us know what your let us know what your favorite music is. <laughs> uh, have you heard of any of these bands? I haven't. Um, but uh, yeah, if you've heard of this stuff, leave a comment in the the post here. Or if you're watching this after the live stream, please leave a comment. And um, if you have any questions for us after the fact, after we're not live, uh, we'd still love to hear from you. And um, this is also a good time to remind everybody we've got 10 people watching now and only six likes on this video so uh let's try to get that number up to meet how many people are watching like the video and also subscribe if you haven't um we do sound booth theaters we do request only and we narrate uh books that are at the precipice that are just being released and it's a great way to get to know authors and narrators and new stories that um are, are coming to Amazon and Audible. So um, please subscribe. And also we've got a couple Facebook groups that we encourage you to join. Uh, Jeff, if you want to. Um, yes, touch on absolutely. That. Um, first of all, the Sound Booth Theater Live Facebook group, you can go there to vote on what our next requests are. Uh, you can make requests. We have a poll running. Um, and just, just to tell you a little bit about that, people request their stuff, like, you know, especially new releases from, from uh, authors or people who are working on their stuff on Royal Road Legends. Um, they, like, they like to request their stuff so they can hear it, you know, performed live and just get a little bit of promo. Uh, but it's a lot of fun watching these polls um, get, get votes and seeing what, what people are interested in hearing. Uh, just did one last night. So if you go to the Sound Booth Theater Live uh, Facebook group, join us there. Um, you can check out the poll. You can check out the latest episode. Um, and, uh, you know, you can post there, too, and have fun just hanging out with other people who like our stuff. And then there's also the Gamelet Society Facebook group, which is basically the place to find out about all the lit RPG news and Gamelet news. Uh, that's happening like it's it's the best place to hang out with other people who read the genre and listen to you know the genre's audiobooks all the all the best authors hang out there and we'll talk to you that's I think that's one of the best things about this genre is that the authors are so accessible and they're they're like the readers you know and and and, and a lot of them probably I would imagine Lars is one of them who you know got inspired to write because of you know because of reading in this genre so um yeah go check out the gamelet society and sound booth theater live facebook groups they're both in the description below indeed uh what do you guys say should we do some more reading absolutely all right all right so um we were talking about shertog who was a dwarf in the town and we're jumping ahead um i'll touch on it a little bit afterwards but um, by the way, I think the chapter is chapter 17, Jeff, and it starts with, um, I have been named a chronicler. So if you want to search that, um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to be talking about the NPCs a little bit afterwards. Cause uh, in my pre-read, I noticed one thing that I really liked about this book was the treatment of the NPCs. Um, and in this small town, you get to really know the NPCs and they, by the end, you're not really feeling like they are you know just pieces in the setting they're like actual characters that you care about which i think is really important in um uh, a story where players can die and be reborn you know what i mean um npcs can't so uh it's important to care about them uh so we're going to be 
introduced to Chertog or get to know him a little bit better in this scene. And uh, again, what Lars, why don't you kind of direct Jeff? What did you have in mind in Chertog's uh, voice and personality? Here. Well, um, he is like a... He basically, when you're at a bar, I mean, that probably sounds really, really uncommon to you, Jeff. But uh, if you imagine yourself at a bar, uh, there will almost always be this one guy who is just major fun to be with, even though he's the one who laughs the loudest. He drinks the most and he's uh, basically a bit of a nuisance because he has, he, you can just, you can't avoid him. This is him. I mean, he's rock. How do you even pronounce that in English? Rock, rocks. Rock, rocks. Rock, rocks. Oh, yeah. Spell it. He, he's loud. He's boisterous, and he rock is it. the person in the world who loud uh, laughs the loudest at his own jokes. That's him. That's so. Him. <laughs> he's, he's well learned, but he yeah well. His sense of humor, yeah, you've got that one. We'll, we'll get to see the sense of humor. <laughs> Almost like a dark jolliness, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I would say, I would say so. Um, I guess my only direction would be really play into the puns. I think there's pretty much a pun on every one of your lines. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> all of <geez>. these. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, this is the introduction to Shertog, and Jeff, you ready? Uh, well, okay, and w do we want to go straight American? You said you want him to be elegant and and, and well, uh, you know, well spoken. You want to go straight American? We can do British as well to just get a little bit more well spoken sounding. If you want? What do you think? Mm. Well. Um... You could try it in British. Uh, I mean, uh, I haven't got a pre uh, preference in there, but uh, whichever you uh, think would work. I, I, I see an ain't in here, so I'm right. going to not do the British. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe a little bit of a Texas, like a Southern, uh, just a hint mm, of that, I wonder? Not necessarily. No? I say ain't. I ain't. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> um, I've been named a chronicler a few days ago, and, uh, I was really just looking for some introductions or instructions rather on, uh, well, what that truly entails. Oh, and, uh, wait, one damn, oh, was that me? No, I'm sorry. I, I'm just, I'm not seeing where you're, where you are. I've, I tried to, I tried to search for that line that you had told me to, and I didn't see it. So try uh, 17, right? Chapter 17, Chertog's face turned grave. That's the key. Boom, ba -da boom. Oh, by the way, we had a, a question from uh, someone from the audience. Um, Tyler Lewis asks to Lars, my wife wants to know what nationality you are. She thinks you're Danish. Is she correct? Bingo. Bingo. Point to Tyler Lewis's wife. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so Even I have a feeling it. of being right. Um, you got it now? Yeah, I'm good. All right, here we go. Um, oh, and uh, wait one damn minute. So that quest you sent me on a couple of days ago, was that also just one big joke setting me up for the whole undead or on the loose shtick? Chertog's face turned grave, and he said, I would never waste a person's time like that. There truly have been bodies going missing. Another the night before yesterday, and I still hope you'll be able to help me with that. I'm pretty damn certain that it ain't undead skeletons, though. Know how I can tell? One side of his mouth started twitching almost imperceptibly when he asked. I gave it some thought, but came up blank and shook my head. Chertog's stomach started shaking while he answered. None of them would dare piss me off, you see? They don't have the guts! 
He bent over and started roaring with laughter. I groaned audibly, but he seemed to take that like encouragement because he collected himself and continued. No, I'm only kidding. Skellies are never frightened. Nothing gets under their skin. <laughs> I rubbed my eyes and held up my hands in defeat. Oh, please, stop already. Chertog, you're killing every funny bone in my body. Oh, God, now I'm doing it as well. Please, let's forget this ever happened. I really need your guidance. That last part apparently caught his attention because he straightened up and wiped away a wayward tear from his eye. <laughs> All right, you spoil sport. I'll let you off easy this time. So you're saying that for some reason you went and made a chronicler of yourself, and now you want to know what that actually means. Well, for one, it means you're dafter than daft to buy into something without looking into the consequences. I suppose there's no turning back and choosing something else, reborn like you. He raised an eyebrow in question. I nodded my head in confirmation and silently admonished myself for having done exactly what he berated me for. Acting without thinking really seemed to be the major theme of the month for me. He nodded to himself, and the corner of his mouth quirked up as he continued. <laughs> well, I guess I'm not one to judge. Listen, I'll give you the short version of my experience as a chronicler and let you judge for yourself whether you've screwed up choosing this, this path for yourself or not. But first, certain formalities have to be observed. Follow me. He led me back to his house, a sturdy reinforced building the size of a large shed and walked in ahead of me, leaving me staring at the inside of the building in astonishment. While everything was clean as a whistle and looked to be made in quality materials, every available inch of the building was packed with books, scroll cases, writing materials, and other paraphernalia, the function of which I could only guess at. A pile of stone tablets stacked on a table here and a pile of animal skins there. And I'm actually going to stop us here. Okay. And I want to jump ahead a little bit because there's some stuff that I don't really want to get into yet. Um, a little bit of spoilers. There's, there's a really interesting scene. Actually, there wasn't as many jokes as I thought. I think I started a little later than uh, I hoped to. And all of the best jokes had been said already. Um, but I'd like to know, so tell us a little bit, Lars, about the chronicler profession, because um, um, I've only seen the term chronicler in uh, one other book so far. And uh, I'm wondering if you got some inspiration from that. But um, as a class profession in a, or a gathering profession, rather, in a lit RPG, it turned out really cool. What can you tell us about the chronicler class? Well, um, I, I basically uh, started out with the, the usual just uh, Googling to see uh, which, car uh, or which uh, classes are there actually out there. And uh, well, I've played a lot of uh, MMOs like everybody out there. Uh, you usually see, well, you have the gathering class, you can mine, you can be a forester or skinning or whatever. And then you have the uh, class where you can produce something. And well, I figured, how about gathering information? I mean, the idea that you could, instead of gather these uh, items and use them for building something, you could gather information and well, basically try to make yourself into the knowledge version of Indiana Jones. That was right. pretty much the idea I started with and uh, disregarding the idea that, uh, that in practice it would mean uh, just tons and tons of study. Um, I think in the book, it works because you get this ability to uh, look into every secret there is uh -huh. out there, every nook and cranny, and it also uh, later on it will, it will also give the possibility to evolve the class into either something more studious and or more well again 
Indiana Jones. Indiana thing. Jones you know, <laughs> on the spot investigation and the like. Right, right. And uh, well, it's really cool. I really like how it plays out in the book because it opens up the the character and story to really interesting quests. Uh, it's not just like okay, you're a gatherer of information. It's or not like a woodcutter where like okay, you got to chop down a hundred trees. Like it's okay this is some new information here's a potential secret let's you know figure this out and you're going to improve your chronicler ability really really interesting way to to get more quests i have to know though well which was the book because i i really don't think i know it oh really uh, um it's um name of the wind name of the wind chronicler oh yeah i mean yeah of course sorry, sorry. <laughs> I mean, the name of the wind is probably in my favorite book ever. I mean, oh yeah, me too. Uh, me too. Doesn't come off. I mean, I even have a quote reference in there. Yes, you, you do. But uh, but yeah, yeah. I'd actually for a moment forgotten that he calls himself the Chronicler. Sorry, I was yeah. definitely thinking of that when I came up with the name back then. <laughs> so I'm just I'm going to jump ahead to uh, the very last little bit. We're gonna close on um, the end of the interaction with Chertog and Daniel. Um, Cause it's just one after the other here. Um, so they start talking about religion a little bit, but um, this is the end of their interaction. Jeff, if you could jump to, he waved his hands dismissively at the air. He waved his hands. last couple minutes here in the live stream um thank you very much for joining us everybody watching um sunless bonbon tyler lewis ian mitchell um i saw charles dean here for a little bit uh taj l is that how i pronounce it um lise eclair who i um just heard as a author herself thank you for watching everybody and for sticking with us to the end uh jeff are you ready to close this off with me I'm ready. All right, here we go. So, do, 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 do. Here we go. So, this is the last little bit of the Wayward Bard. Once again, don't forget to like and subscribe here. And um, I'd go pick up the book. It's a really, really good read. And uh, if you're into a game lit, lit RPG, then it, I, I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, thank you, Lars, for joining us. And Jeff, why don't we uh, end this off? All right. He waved his hands dismissively at the air. I, along with most dwarves, don't bother with her. Who choose to worship a god of human aspect of their own free will? But sure, I get the attraction. If searching for knowledge is your calling, you might as well go all the way and join the cult. Or whatever it is the followers of Saroon do. For what it's worth, I haven't heard any negative stuff about her. And I've heard tell of especially talented chroniclers who have received special attention from Saroon. No details, however. If you want some better information, you'd better keep your ears stiff. Ugh, I get it, Shertog. I almost preferred the skeleton jokes. Thank you very much for the information, however. I'd, I'd better get to work then and ask around for anybody who knows a bit more about Saroon. Oh, um, or maybe I could just ask Mallard Bullhop for information on Saroon? He smirked. Yeah, well, if you want the easy solution, I guess you could also ask the only resident expert on all things spiritual. Don't worry. If you were daft enough to keep running around asking the whole world about Saroon, I would have pointed you in his direction. Eventually. I turned around and started walking towards the door while I threw my hands in the air in frustration. <sighs> You're a horrible teacher, Chertog. He tailed me out of the building and snapped his fingers as if he'd just thought of something. Eh, you know what's the difference between you and these good people? on the ground around here? I kept walking. Enough already, Chertog. One of you composes, the others decompose. <laughs> I kept walking and held my hands over my ears. 
That didn't stop him from shouting after me, however. <laughs> what? I'm funny. This guy was positively laughing his skull off. <laughs> As I left the cemetery, shaking my head at the severe lack of normal people in Grant's Crossing, I surprised myself by coming to the realization that I actually liked Chertok. Sure, his humor was horrible, and he was as barmy as they come, but he seemed genuine and kind, deep down. All right, everybody, that's it from us. Uh, once again, my name is Justin Thomas James. Thank you very much to Jeff Hayes for providing voices for us. And of course, the one, the only Lars Machmuller, the author. Thank you very much for writing this book and um, joining us on Sound Booth Theater here. And thank you all for watching and staying with us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Until then, bye-bye. Later.